So there you go. Yep. There is finally the answer. And I know Melody's yeah. been waiting patiently <laughs> for so long. <laughs> I'm Ivan of Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms Lore, I have the distinct pleasure of talking with Ed Greenwood about the much-requested Kingdom of Cormier. Cormier, known as the Forest Country and the Land of the Purple Dragon. According to Ed, its first appearance was on a teaser map released by Dragon Magazine in 1986. Cormier was later revealed in various other articles in Dragon, Ed's first Realms novel Spellfire, as well as the 1987 Forgotten Realms campaign set. One of my personal favorite facts about Cormier is that it's where you're most likely to find Tressum! a breed of adorable flying cats with an uncanny intelligence and a penchant for mischief. Here's what Ed has to say about it. The easy shorthand for somebody who doesn't know much about the realms and wants to know what is Cormir and why is it here? Yeah, that used to be the old TSR question. What is this feature <laughs> yeah. and why is it here? Meaning, like, what mm -hmm. would we use it for? And so the, the short form for Cormir is if you need a country to have King Arthur and his round table in, this is that country. Cool. This is cool, cool, cool. This is the the good kingdom of the knights. And in fact, there was a a TSR staff designer whom I won't name, um, who said he they were planning for what would happen in the realms, and he said this is much too nice a, a country. It just has to go away <laughs> because yeah. he wanted. A realms of infinite adventure possibilities and the way sure. of doing that was to do the points of light where the whole world is going to heck in a handbasket and you're stuck in the middle of it so adventurers are in great demand and sure. therefore the the good nice realm of law and order with with um wizards war wizards who are the secret agents the the secret police and I, I'm dropping mm -hmm. inverted commas around secret police because it's the <laughs> secret police that everybody in the country knows about, so they behave, are backing I'm the up. the not-so-secret police. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah who are yeah, backing yeah. up the the knights who are everywhere and the nobles who are backing up the knights, and there's law and order and everything's good and hunky-dory, and the dragon throne is, is where, you know, is sat upon by people that everybody else looks up to. Oh, if I was ever a great hero, I'd want to be a king like him. And of course, sure. if, you, if you're at court, you know that that isn't quite accurate, but it's a great image. So that's Cormir. Sure. It's, it's, and if you do want to have adventures or live or read about fiction set in a country that most of the time, except when we're writing about it, is at peace and has yeah, law yeah, and yeah, order yeah. and is safe <laughs> to live in, that's the country. <laughs> that's funny. So do, was it first conceptualized as that, as kind of an analog for, for the Arthurian times? Or is that something that kind of developed after talking about it and, and developing those correlations? Uh, no, I had that before there was D&D. &D. Okay, so think of, you know, five, six, and seven-year-old Eddie. Okay. The movie Excalibur is years in the future, but I am reading all my um, King Arthur Knight uh, books, edited by Howard Pyle, uh, written by Howard Pyle, or other ones were edited by Sterling Lanier or whatever, and they had all these great illustrations by Pyle or Wyeth or whatever of you know valiant knights and pure ladies and all this stuff, and. I had this image of Sherwood Forest and Sherwood Forest of um, Robin Hood fame as the gigantic oaks with limbs going everywhere, trees that dwarf castles, sure. and they yeah, had just yeah. tons of foliage hanging off them. And like the scene in Excalibur of all the knights riding in slow motion through the apple blossoms, you know, so they're all riding in their armor and the apple blossoms are flying. Well, I was picturing them riding through a deep forest like all this. So the trees are dwarfing them, but they're still impressive. That to me wow. is, I wanted to put that into my fantasy setting and Cormier was what I came up with to put it in. And then, of course, once it was there in fiction, it immediately became this thing where I can tell endless stories. If I think of Cormier as France was, real-world medieval France, 
Interesting. Real world um, medieval France, the king was first among equals, meaning uh -huh. all the other noble families figured, okay, I'll have my turn on the throne or our family will because that royal family that's on the throne, they just happened to get lucky and grab the throne before we did. We're just as good as them. So the king is first among equals as opposed to, no, that is the king, which is the, the sort of English way. I, I'm, I'm talking right, about right. mythology. You know, for sure. who shall ever draw the sword from the stone shall henceforth be the rightful king of all England. <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. and everybody yeah. else goes, yeah, and as we saw, Patrick Stewart's character in Excalibur, I saw what I saw. The boy drew the sword. Sure. If a boy drew the sword, then a boy shall be king. You know, that sort of <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, so, but in France, it was the first among equals. So I immediately realized that's the sort of stories I can tell in Cormier because there's all this endless intrigue amongst the nobles and the war wizards and the royal family and various people who want the throne and various people who want to go independent like Marsember down in the south and Arabelle up in the north. So we can tell into the stories sure. of, um, pretty my lord. Did did your last goblet of wine taste a bit off? <laughs> it did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, that was because of the poison that so and so put it. Yes, I know he's been poisoning my wine for the last twenty years. <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Yeah, I can tell into <laughs> stories like that. <laughs> That's great. So that kind of explains why it's called the forest country. Can you give just a brief synopsis of why Cormier might be called the land of the purple dragons, other than the obvious, I suppose? Sure. Okay. So yeah, it, the, the the forest country, the forest kingdom, because the whole heart of the realm is this big honking forest. It's been cut back over time, uh -huh, uh -huh. but originally it was everywhere. Now, the land of the purple dragon was because, as depicted in the novel, Cormier, a novel, which the, the uh -huh. brief for that, J Jeff Grubb and I wrote it, um, uh, Bill Larson edited it, and um, the brief for that was, let's do Michener in the Realms, James Michener. He wrote all these cool. giant novels that were used to be in all the libraries in, in America in which he would tell the story of a place, and he would go through the generations while we were doing the same thing. And the, the land that is now Cormier was originally the personal hunting domain and lair of a black dragon so old that his scales had gone purple. He was the wow. purple dragon. And wow. an elf lord who was a great mage, the elves moved in, and there was war between the dragons and the elves, and there was this truce and this bargain between Ilifer of the elves. And there's a scene in that novel where the elf with his staff is confronting the dragon. And they made a deal, and and... The dragon lost the deal, so he had to surrender the land to the elves. And then, of course, along come the humans from Chancel, uh, from from the south, from the Ville on Reach, sure. and they they establish uh, Chancel God, with now Sel God, and they also settle all along what is going to become Suzeo and so on. And they sort of push the elves aside, and to control them, there is this elf Barabel wants. <laughs> He wants his people not to be butchered by these vastly more right. numerous and ruthless humans who will reproduce like rabbits. So he, he hits upon the idea of controlling, guiding the human expansion and making it as peaceful and orderly as possible by stepping in and being the first sort of royal magician of Cormier. Wow. So in effect, he serves the humans, but he does it to guide them to make this uh, transition as peaceful as possible. Sort of like... If you had an Indian chief in colonial America who realizes these white people in these ships are just going to keep coming and they're right. just going to keep pushing us and it's going to be butchery, how can I control it so it isn't butchery? Right. And that's right. exactly what Baravo was doing. And at the same time, he gets to mold the kingdom. <laughs> and part of molding the kingdom, he's molding the attitudes of the common people. Don't just cut down a tree. Don't stamp on a on a a plant because you don't know what it is. It might be a uh -huh. useful medicinal herb. Le live with the land the way we elves do, and the land will reward you. Which is, a, um, ironically, is very Arthurian. You know, right, right, the, yeah. The king is the land. The land is the king. You know, this sort of thing. Yeah, all yeah. the Grail stuff. Um, but but I mean, that's what Cormier was, and that's what it became. And it's the land of the purple dragon. 
because then the Obarskiers, the who become the first ruling family, they adopt the purple dragon as their heraldic badge. And then yeah. it's the dragon throne and they use the purple dragon. And so it's the land of the purple dragon. And sometimes some kings who sit upon the dragon throne and Azun the fourth, the famous one who we saw in all the books, was certainly one of them. Azun gets called the purple dragon. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that's really interesting. And one thing I find kind of fascinating about all this is that Cormier was so heavily influenced by the elves and elven culture. Mm -hmm. Other than that, do you have anything, I guess, specific about Cormier that you think is lesser known that people should know? Uh, I would just say that if you want to have a a place with with looks very medieval that says King Arthur to you or uh, sure. okay, stage medieval, you know, but I mean, uh, uh, the woman in gowns, the men in armor, when they're not in armor, sure. they're in puff sleeves and, and the half head. cloaks and so on. Um, they wear pointy toed shoes, you know, the uh, cod pieces, all this stuff. If that's what turns you on in your conception of medieval, then this is sure. your place. Great. Um, if you want to have, uh, just plain laborers dressed in work smocks or dressed like Robin Hood and his merry men, and the woman dressed the same way, uh -huh, and there's uh -huh. there's one of those shown in the in one of the line drawings in the Cormier um, source book, the second edition Cormier um, accessory. Um, this is the place to do it. Um, this is the if if that's what turns your butt your buttons, yeah. And if it's like, okay, the matter of Britain, if that's yeah, your background, yeah. this is where yeah. to put it. Okay, Realms fans, I have a very important question for you. Does Undeath make me look thin? <laughs> if you want to get this shirt and or more like it, be sure to go to edgreenwood.net where you can check out his merch as well as a ton of other new stuff that he's been working on. And best of all, if you go to Ed's Patreon, like right now, link in the description, you can find extended versions of all of these Realms lore videos and much more. I'm talking podcasts, exclusive articles, VIP Discord rules, exclusive merch. The list continues. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Where in Cormier did uh, Nalavoth, the dragon that died in Death of a Dragon, where did that dragon fall and what happened to her body after the war's conclusion? And they were hoping for anything you can give them that doesn't, you know, betray any kind of uh, NDA agreement that you might have. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is an NDA still in existence. <laughs> uh, that dragon uh, was the creation of Troy Denning. Okay, Troy planned to write more stuff, um, more fiction, uh, involving the Gazness, involving the one Gazneth who survives. Sure, the Cormero sure. Gazneth. Um, uh -huh. I'm trying not to spoil your things for people, yeah. <laughs> um, but at the same time, identify things for other people. Uh, and that, because of that, the exact whereabouts of her crash landing and death uh, had to remain um, sort of indeterminate. I sure, can tell you sure. that if you look at the Mike Schley map of Cormier in 1479 DR, the beautiful okay. map that he mm -hmm. gave us, then where the dragon comes down, on that map you will find a notation uh, west of Cisea called Mage Keep. Okay. And on that map, above the words Mage Keep, is one of those little map logos that, that says Ruin. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah. a little tower with <laughs> battlements. Okay, yep, yep. if you go due north from that, until you hit the edge, the southern edge of the King's Forest, where the trees start, and then you bump due west just a tiny amount, so you're in the valley between the two hills <laughs> that are there. That's where the dragon went down. Okay. Okay. Um, the NDA is still in place. It, it is increasingly clear to me that Troy will probably never write what was planned. Sure. But one of the reasons I have been avoiding saying it was not to tie his hands. What we do know is that the body disappears very quickly. And it disappears because members of the cult of the dragon 
who have been watching all of this. Remember, it's war in the in the realm right now, so they can yeah. watch um, armies march and everything. So they they are staying high on lookouts and watching, just like everybody else who lives in the kingdom is, trying to not to be somewhere that they might run into an army or an army might come running for them. But they could sure see it when a dragon flies through the sky, and particularly when it then dives down on armies and starts doing <laughs> it's things. Hard, it's hard to miss. <laughs> it's hard to miss. So they see where she goes down. They see that she never comes back mm-hmm. uh, up into the air. So right. she's either sleeping there, layering there, gorging herself, and then sleeping after she eats, or she's dead or wounded. Mm. In any case, as members of that cult, they want to get there and get right. the dragon. And they do. And Interesting. some members of this cult have spells. So, whereas you and I would stare at this dragon, which is like the size of about six houses, yeah, and say, well, you know, if you and I struggle for a couple of hours with our best weapons, we might be able to get one scale off the dragon and take yeah, it home. Yeah, yeah. And, and it would be the size of a door, <laughs> and we'd be staggering under his weight, but with the pair of us, or maybe a hired wagon, we could get it home. These guys can just make the whole carcass go away magically, wow. transport wow. it, because they don't have to transport it far. All they have to do is transport it west over the Stormhorns uh-huh. into one of those valleys uh, east of Old Axe between the Stormhorns and their foothills, and then they can work on it, and they won't be seen. Yeah. And, and that's for awesome. as long as they need to, which is what they do. So there you yep. go. There is I think that's finally great. the answer. So that's great. I, I would say that that's perfectly fair as not a 100% fully definitive answer. But you know what? It's a lot of very valuable speculation on what could have happened. So I think I think you're good. And you can have fun with all this stuff. But yeah. And the other thing is, one of the things you have to remember is the ladies, the noble daughters... Uh-huh. are fully educated, usually become the accountants, the internal accountants wow. of their yep. family, over top of the, the clerks, because somebody sure. has to watch the clerks to make sure they're not robbing the family blind. And it's uh-huh. usually, not always, it's usually the mother, and she usually wants to train her replacements, and it's usually the daughters, not all of them, because wow. you know it's not a gender thing. Um, that somebody would be good with numbers or bad with numbers or have a head sure. for business deals or and shrewdly judging what people really are when they're lying to your face with a smile uh-huh. or not. Uh, it's not a gender thing, but the women are full participants in what the family does. Uh-huh. It's not um, people who, who are running Cormier have to get out of their heads any notion that they may have gained by watching bad movies of the Three Musketeers, sure, where sure, all the women sure. walk around with fans and giant petticoats. Yeah, can get in the vapors. And right. say, oh, <laughs> la, my lord. Oh, yeah, la, yeah, yeah, my yeah. lord. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, they may do that as a joke sure, yeah, at, at feasts and revels, but it's usually the women who are keeping score and taking names. They yeah, may not appear cool. to be, but when, sure. when they're dead... The noble lord, the head of the house, is getting drunk and saying, So I said to him, Ha ah, ha, I said, Y'all yeah, never yeah, yeah, yeah. me. <laughs> you know, they're standing there in this creek yeah. in the corner watching the faces and expressions of all the young men listening and going, He doesn't like uh-huh. us. Oh, he he's hero uh-huh. worshiping our father. That's useful. Um, you know, they they're doing that. And right. which is yeah. Yeah. again, it's all storytelling, um, opportunities for storytelling. That's what I want to build in to my fictional Cormier when I'm writing about it and my um, right. at the gaming table Cormier when I'm running it. If somebody were to come to you and say, Mr. Greenwood, I would love to run hey. uh, a session of Cormier <laughs> and I would like you to be a player in it. What would be the one thing that you would be looking for that you think would make that the best possible game? <laughs> uh... It depends on, <laughs> I'd have to read the table to see what the best possible sure. game for. Because 
Sure. It would be royal fun to go on a pub crawl with a bunch of drunken young nobles in Suzale. Yeah. That would be yeah. royal fun. <laughs> but it might not be fun for a particular set of gamers around the table. Sure. You know, that, that might sure. not be what turns their crank. Um, uh, in the same way, I happen to like um, rural adventuring, the villages like Evening Star and then going to sure. the haunted halls and so on. Um, but other people may, may go, oh, not another dungeon crawl. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, so it depends on what turns your crank with it, intrigue or whatever. But yeah, I love adventuring in Cormier. I would love it to be at the time of Azun and Phil Farrell because yeah. that's the time I don't have to think about. It, it's like saying, which edition of the game do you like to des design for? Yeah. Well, obviously I'm doing most of my design for fifth edition now. Right, the right. The easiest one for me is second edition because I can think in second edition without having to look anything up. I just write exactly. It. Exactly. You know, so in the same way, that, what what do I love versus um, what would work for that the play session? And it's also knowing the players. For me, it's because Cormier, like the, Cormier and the Dales and Waterdeep are my, sort of my three faves with Silver and Moon <laughs> if <laughs> I had to choose a fourth. Things I'd love to share, places I'd like to be in the realm and do things. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked what you saw in the video, we would really appreciate it if you hit the like button and we'd love it if you subscribed. Hit the bell to stay updated and be sure to find Ed on Patreon if you want tons more Realms lore like this, link in the description. We'd also like to extend an extra special thank you for our sponsor, RPG Match, as well as all of the protectors of the Realms on Patreon that make this possible, especially our top supporters, the Legends of the Realms, Stephen Snow, Martin Berlanda, John Foster, Gerald Brady, Hunter Weber, Michael Scattergood, Jeremy E. Grenemeyer, Robert McDonald, Varesia, Melody Seegers, Gustavo Torcado, Puffles, Brian Kreutzel, and RPG Match. Thank you.